Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Stay In and Speak Out for Climate Action. Today, we are pleased to be presenting a conversation with Congresswoman Kim Schreier, alongside our National Field Director, Tricia Del Iacono, and Rachel, she Rachel Heaton, a super mom and member of the Muckleshoot Tribe. Before we get started with their conversation, though, we have a special treat for you. Um, we're going to be hearing a special performance from Mr. G, who is a Latin Grammy Award winning singer, and he's our favorite bilingual performer. Usually he performs for us in Washington, D.C. when we're allowed to be together in person. But today we're feeling very nostalgic for live performances and in-person contact and meetings. So we're going to show you this great video from Mr. G from a performance from last year at the Key West Theater. Take it away, Mr. G. Dinosaur. They used to roam the world, now they don't live here anymore But here we are alive, on this earth together The climate's changing fast, we're in for nasty weather Whoa, 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 whoa. Just like a dinosaur It's time to work as one, time to take a stand We are beyond borders now, we come from distant lands We may speak different languages, we may eat different foods The only thing that matters is what we say and do say, Like a dinosaur, yeah. Change is gonna come to everyone and everything. Don't forget, the dinosaurs once were king. Let's do it for the animals, let's do it for the trees Let's come together one and all in our communities We gotta turn the ship around, the earth can't take it anymore Or we'll end up extinct, just like the dinosaurs said Well, those were that's a powerful message for Mr. G today and, and perfectly on point for the conversation that we want to have about um, how we are all stewards of this earth that we're living on. And I'm so excited to kick off this conversation with Trisha Del Iacono and Congresswoman Kim Schreier and Rachel Heaton. Thanks for tuning in today. As I mentioned earlier, I am here representing Moms Clean Air Force, a nationwide movement of more than a million moms and dads united to fight air pollution and climate change. I am excited to introduce our panel today. First, Rachel Heaton is an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Tribe of Auburn, Washington, and a descendant of the Duwam Duwamish Tribe. She's also a proud mother to three kids. Rachel was one of many natives and other folks who helped the city of Seattle divest its $3 billion from Wells Fargo, in part because of its funding of the D Dakota Access Pipeline. This victory prompted her to co-found Mazaska Talks, an indigenous developed tool to help other communities divest their cities and organizations from banks contributing to the desecration of our earth. She is also currently a lead culture educator in her tribal community. Trisha Delo Iocono is National Field Manager for Moms Clean Air Force. 
helping to develop and deploy strategic plans to increase grassroots advocacy on key environmental issues. Trisha works with elected leaders across the country to advocate, from tox advocate for strong policies to protect our children's health from toxic chemicals, air pollution, and the impacts of climate change. Trisha has a Master's of Business Administration with a BS in Marketing and serves on the board for the Columbia Center School of Public Health in New York City. She lives in New Jersey with her three young sons and her infant daughter. And on a personal note, Trisha is one of my absolute favorite colleagues to work with here at Moms. I can't wait for you to hear more from her as well. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing our esteemed guest and member of the United States House of Representatives, Congresswoman Kim Schreier, who represents Washington's 8th con Congressional District. Prior to being elected to Congress in 2018, Congresswoman Schreier spent her career as a pediatrician, working with children across the Puget Sound region and helping families navigate the healthcare system. As the only woman doctor in Congress, and as a patient living with type 1 diabetes, Dr. Schreier understands the very real fear of healthcare costs and access for people living with pre-existing conditions. And as a physician who has worked in the broken healthcare system, Dr. Schreier understands what changes need to be made to make it work better for both patients and providers. She lives, lives in Washington with her husband, David, and son, Sam. In this year's House Appropriations Package, Congresswoman Schreier introduced a provision with support from Moss Clean Air Force to maintain strict standards around mercury air toxins and ensure that all children can breathe clean air. And we're gonna be focusing a lot on that issue today. The mercury and air toxic standards have been under attack by the Trump administration. And now I'll turn to Tricia and Rachel to kick off this conversation with Congresswoman, Sh Congresswoman Schreier. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. So for nearly a decade, moms have been organizing to demand meaningful action to protect our children's health from toxic pollution. One of our first campaigns 10 years ago was to advocate for the finalization and implementation of the mercury and air toxic standard. These standards protect babies from mercury pollution, a dangerous neurotoxin emitted from coal-fired power plants that harms fetal brain development. Members of Moms Clean Air Force fought hard for the mercury and air toxic standard which were implemented in 2012 and give us a life-saving, effective pollution prevention program that specifically protects pregnant women and babies from mercury pollution and other harmful toxins. However, the mercury and air toxic standard, as Molly said, recently came under attack by the Trump administration. In April, during a global public health crisis, the EPA Administrator, Andrew Wheeler, finalized a proposal that weakens these standards and puts the health of our babies on the line. Congresswoman Schreier has been leading a charge of members in Congress to fight back against this ruthless attack on our children's health. Now, before we turn this over to Rachel to ask some questions from your constituents, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak about your important work on protecting our mercury and air toxic standard, as well as your priorities in Congress. Uh, thank you so much for that really kind introduction, and I am delighted to be with you. You know, before I even talk about the topic at hand, I have to tell you, it was wonderful to listen to Mr. G, and also to see how cool the flute looks, because my 11-year-old Sam uh, plays the flute, and I my my hope is that he will be able to, uh, to use that in such a cool setting uh, like this. He's not really an orchestra kid, he's more of a band kid. Um, but I so glad to be with you all to talk about one of my major priorities, which is keeping our planet and our environment and our air safe for this generation and for the next generations, and to really taking bold climate action to save off the worst effects of climate change. Because this is not just about the future. Unfortunately, the impacts are already here with drought, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, rising sea levels and disappearing coral reefs and habitat. And as a pediatrician, I also see the health impacts of climate change and this changing climate on our children. These are particularly pronounced, and I think this is very timely, on communities of color with increased rates of asthma, for example. Uh, and, but we also forget sometimes to think about the emotional impact on children from floods hurricanes and the loss of their homes and their schools and having to move. And this is really scary and traumatic for children. And 
And, and not just that, I, I would like to just even think globally and look outside of the effects in our own country to what's going on in the rest of the world with floods, rising sea levels, uh, drought, famine, vector-borne diseases that will disproportionately affect children. And so I'm delighted to partner with Matt because the work that we do together uh, is all to protect our air, our clean air, children, pregnant women from the toxic effects of mercury and other toxins. You know, under the Obama administration, industry made all the necessary changes to comply with standards. And now the Trump administration is really needlessly rolling them back. And just today, the Trump administration announced that it's scaling back limits on toxic waste from coal power plants. It is like they are trying to resuscitate uh, a dinosaur, frankly. Um, and this waste includes mercury and arsenic, lead. All of these things are neurotoxins for children that will lead to generations of lost potential because of lower IQs, inattention, and academic failure. And that is moving in the wrong direction. It's jeopardizing our children's health and the next generation's health. And just please know that I'm always excited to partner with you to make sure that we do the right thing, make sure our children grow up healthy and safe, and that we leave them a planet that is also healthy and safe and durable. Hi, right, thank you. Um, thank you, Trisha and Molly for put, you know, for all the work that you guys did to get this together. This is, I'm excited to have this conversation. And Congresswoman, I want to thank you for your words and thank you for your important work for protecting our mercury and air toxic standards. Um, I know particularly in our tribal communities, um, this is for, it, it, it's important for everyone, but we particularly, because we live off of the land, fishing um, as a to continually is our mountains, collecting our, our plants and, and our medicines. Um, when these when these toxins go up into the air, our community consumes them when we serve them to our community. So this work is so important. And um, I, I think it's great to hear the work that you're continuing to do because it does, um, it, it affects our communities as well. And, and we've always said anything that benefits our communities is going to help everyone. But, um, we're so happy to have you here with us today and we're excited to give you the opportunity to respond with some questions from your constituents. And um, so let's jump right in. Um, recently, the Committee on Climate Crisis has released a groundbreaking roadmap that would put us on a path towards climate safety protect the health of our, and the futures of our children. So as the only pediatrician in Congress, what do you see as your role in helping to move this important agenda forward? Uh, thank you for asking that question, Rachel. You know, I think first is just that I bring the perspective of a pediatrician. And so one of the things that I'm so critical of other members of Congress for is that they only think for the next election. They're not thinking about the next generation. And that is just part of my DNA as as a pediatrician and as a mom. And so to always have that compass of thinking towards the future and what this means for the next generation. The other is that you can pull together climate change with health and particularly with children's health. And so being able to ground it in that, I mean, it has been shown that as we try to bring the public along with us, it's getting easier, but it's still tough. But that rooting this in health effects of grandparents thinking about their children with asthma, that is one of the most potent ways of winning over public opinion. And so I can link those together and, uh, and I'm excited to do just that. I'm glad you said that, um, you know, because, um, you know, in our teaching as native people, we, we focus on the seven generations, meaning everything that we plan today is we think about the seven generations after us. So I'm glad that in, in that mindset. Um, so thank you for, for, you know, for saying that. Um, but now if you're ready, we have a few questions from some of your tiniest constituents. Um, the first question comes from nine-year-old Taz Santori, who lives in Auburn, Washington. And Taz shares his thoughts on how we can address the climate. Hi, I'm Taz Santori, and I'm nine, and I live in Auburn, Washington. So can you share with me some ways, uh, some promising solutions of how we can address the climate crisis? Spread the word to everyone and use clean energy like solar panels and windmills. Okay. Uh, thank you, Taz. 
So Congresswoman, I'm wondering, what do you think are some of the most important ways that we should be addressing climate change? Well, first of all, Taz, thank you for your great ideas about wind turbines and solar energy. I'm gonna throw a couple your way that maybe you haven't really thought about. Um, one of them is that there's, there's a gas called methane that's even more of a, um, a, a, a climate influencing uh, chemical than carbon dioxide. And a, a big source of that methane comes from cow burps. And cows eat, they burp a ton and that ends up polluting. And it turns out that if you feed cows a certain type of seaweed, it can cut down on the methane in their burps and it can help address climate change. I thought you would like that as a nine-year-old. Now, here's another one. It turns out that farmers can really be a key to addressing the climate crisis because it turns out that a lot of carbon dioxide is in the soil and that when you stir up the soil to plant seeds, when you till, it releases that carbon dioxide up into the, up into the air. But if you plant what they call cover crops, these are crops that are just the short, they're in between the regular plants that you're growing in your fields, but it holds the carbon in the soil. And, so, and it also helps the soil to be healthier for farmers. So it makes for better food, less need for fertilizers, less need for water, and it keeps carbon dioxide in the soil. So it's really, really important. And then I'm gonna say one more thing because it's something that all of us can do. And it's something we forget just conserving energy, just making sure you turn off the light, you don't drive around more than you need to, or your parents don't drive around more than you need to, that you buy uh, energy efficient cars, refrigerators, you name it. But the less electricity we use and the less gas we use, the better off the planet is. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, our, our younger constituents, our nine-year-olds would definitely appeal to the how burping comment and relate and relate, um, but I'm glad that you also shared um, some non-conventional ways that we don't always think of. I think it's always easy to go solar power, wind power, and those kind of more um, mainstream um, ways. But um, thank you for for sharing some of the more um, just kind of non-conservative ways that we don't typically think about every day. Um, so our next question from Sovereign Bill, who lives in Washington. She's 15 years old and she's the voice of Molly in the PBS children's show, Molly from Denali. Um, Sovereign has some thoughts about the importance of holding big corporations accountable for addressing their pollution emissions and being good stewards of our environment. And so here's a video from Sovereign. Hail. my name is Sovereign. I'm 15 years old and I'm from Washington. The biggest challenges when facing climate change i think is holding big corporations accountable because they are a big um factor in co2 emissions and just a leading cause in uh damaging and hurting the earth but um yeah so i think that's that's it so thank you so as Sovereign tells us, corporations are very powerful and a huge contributing factor to our climate crisis. Congresswoman, can you share how you are ensuring that the fossil fuel industry is held accountable to the pollution that they are emitting into our atmosphere? Well, Sovereign, I love that question because you are absolutely right that uh, polluting companies need to be held accountable. It's kind of like when we went after the tobacco industry because tobacco was addictive and it was causing all kinds of health problems, they need to be part of the solution. Now, right now under this administration, I feel like we are just playing defense. We are just trying to not allow relaxation of clean air and clean water standards. We're just trying to make it by. But let me tell you that I am feeling cautiously optimistic that soon we will have an administration that shares your interest, Sovereign, and my interest in making sure we transition into clean energy and away from fossil fuels. Right now, the fossil fuel industry gets all kinds of tax breaks. They get leases for cheap. They get, they get financial incentives for polluting. And we need to address the real cost of carbon. And that means we will probably have something like a price on carbon but it also means that we need to just switch around how we give our subsidies, that we need to be subsidizing carbon capture. 
Uh, we need to be subsidizing responsible agricultural practices, subsidizing solar and wind power, and even offshore wind turbines. We gotta put our money where our mouths are. And, and it's really how we spend our money is a reflection of our values. So the accountability is coming. And unfortunately, it is not happening right at this moment to both your disappointment and mine. Congresswoman, thank you so much for those thoughtful answers and for taking so much time to speak with us today. Um, we're almost ready to wrap up, but before we leave, I wanted to take the time to thank you for your vote recently delivering the America Act that protects our postal service will ensure all Americans have equal access to voting. Um, in this election now, more than ever, every vote counts. And as our country grapples with a global public health pandemic, it has never been more important to ensure that all voters have access to casting their votes safely this November. Black and brown voters are usually the most likely people to vote for, leader, for leaders that support climate action, and they're also the voters most likely to have more limited access to voting and experience voter suppression. Um, we are deeply grateful for your support of our Postal Service your efforts to ensure that all Americans have equal access to voting in this election. Voter access is important to tribal communities such as mine and, and other communities um, that are far more desolate than even my own community. Um, so we are grateful for your work, especially in the Do you have any additional thoughts about ensuring access to voting during this election or beyond what um, additional actions are to be taken to strengthen your relationships also with tribal community? Of course. Um, well, I feel like there are a couple answers here. You know, the first is just that it has been my honor to work with the tribes. And as you know, right, you know, the Muckleshoot, the Chihuahua, uh, and the Snoqualmie, a little bit of the Yakima and the Colville are in my district. And we've been working closely together on things like education and housing. And we've had some really big wins. And not just that, we have these common goals of clean water and clean air and preserving salmon habitat and really saving that endangered species that you have treaty rights to and preserving our natural orcas. Um, so in that, I can feel like that's one part of the question. The other part really is about access to the ballot box, making sure every vote gets cast and gets counted. And, uh, you know, voting is an interesting thing because, uh, it happens differently in each state. And we are seeing efforts that I think are to sabotage the vote, whether it's voter suppression, limiting the ability to, to vote by mail, uh, removing mailboxes, you name it, that are trying to interfere with people's ability to cast a, a ballot. And, and uh, you know what we need to do is make sure that in every state there are special instructions on how you can get your vote passed. So in Washington state, for example, it could be if you're going to go to a polling place, go early, wear your mask, take an umbrella and a chair and a book and be ready to wait. Um, and that could be the message, for example, in Georgia too. Remember how they had weights around the block? But there is a way, even if you're gonna do in-person voting, to do it safely um, and, and to make sure you get counted. Get in that line early and wait. In our state, we do have drop boxes, which is very helpful. So even if the mail is slowed down, we can su submit our ballot to a drop box. So in every state, we're gonna have to have really good recommendations for people on how to get their ballots counted. And sometimes that's dropping your ballot off at the elections office or taking it to a polling place. You don't have to stand in line, you can just submit it there. Sometimes it's simply mailing it at, at least eight days in advance to make sure it gets there in time. But let me tell you that I will continue to fight to make sure that our uh, U.S. Postal Service has all the resources it needs and that we not only stop DeJoy from continuing to put obstacles in the way, but that he reverse the things he's done with removing sorting machines and removing post boxes. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I actually, uh, you know, from, from cow burps to to dinosaurs, I think we've run the gamut to voter access, to something important I think that you said that I wanna reflect before we close. She said uh, earlier on, you said, how we spend our money is a reflection of our values. And I think there's something so profound in that and it's something that we're all sh also showing our children how we behave and how we teach them to advocate. And when we have kids like Sovereign 
and and we are are they're learning from us and we're learning from them i think there's just something incredible about that and i have to say this was so definitely an event and a conversation with pediatrician because it's so clear where your heart is and where and where um and, and what drives you and in in your work you're doing congress so thank you so much for being here thank you so much rachel from for joining as well and trisha our national field manager and we'll wrap up now and say goodbye. But before we go, I just want to say we have another stay in and speak out for climate action next week, September 8th, with Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland. And that is at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Congresswoman. Dr. Schreier, thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Tricia. And we're calling it a day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>